Thank you. So this is uh, work primarily done by Philip Rudiger, but he's in Berlin and, and I live in Austin, so I'm presenting it. Um, so who here has a Jupyter notebook that has a plot in it? All right. Or a table or an image or an equation? All right. And maybe you might want to explore some of these things or maybe share them with someone else? All right. OK, panel is for you, for all of you. Uh, panel is a new package, but it's built on top of uh, Bokeh's 1.x release. It's not 1.0, it's now up to 1. Point something, but uh, this is the, uh, the solid supported API into the future, so it's a great thing to be building on. And uh, even though it's built on Bokeh, it, uh, you can use just about any plotting library. It's designed to be the, the unifying thing, the one unifying thing in SciPy, except now we're into arguments at the end of the talk, so we'll get to that. But uh, uh, it is meant for any plotting library. So it is built on Bokeh, but Bokeh is like a web toolkit for it. It is not in any way customized for Bokeh plots. It's just anything you want to put together and share with people. And uh, it uh, fully supports notebooks. It's meant to be uh, used, well, our typical way of using it is to develop Python in a notebook, immediately deploy it, get feedback, go back to the notebook, edit the notebook, and deploy it, and go back and forth. But it doesn't depend on Jupyter in any way. So you can deploy it without having Jupyter installed, which is important for a lot of people we work with. If they're in a production environment, they need a, um, uh, they need a minimal set of packages with no opportunity to execute live code, even through weird backdoors. So having, not having Jupyter required is important. Having full support for Jupyter is also important. So I'll just, uh, just so you see this kind of the scope of the library, I will just uh, go to some demos. Uh, most of these demos are available at the panel website, which is panel.pybiz.org. There's a gallery on there. Other ones are at examples.pybiz.org. We haven't really sorted things out very well. So uh, here's one particular example. Uh, since we're following on from the Geo Talks, I figure if people are still around, we'll use Geo example. Uh, this is a um, uh, just showing cross-linking between uh, a bunch of different plots, allowing you to select on one and having it show up on the other. This is a um, kind of medium difficulty example, trying to link up very different types of plots. It takes a little bit of code. Uh, this is a kind of an exa advanced example. This is a um, this is. Uh, some obscure thing called a, an attractor. And the important thing about it is that each attractor is governed by different parameters. And so when you select a different type of attractor, you get different parameters. And you can vary those parameters for that attractor. Um, but when you select a different type, uh, you get completely different parameters. This is, uh, this is a more complex uh, type of dashboard you might build. It's still just one Jupyter notebook. It's not an insane amount of code. But it's more um, advanced topic. Uh, this is just demonstrating that you can handle a lot of different pl plotting libraries. Uh, this is a bokeh-based plot from HVPlot. You've seen a lot of those if you've been in this room all day. Uh, this is an Altair plot, Plotly, Matplotlib is a little messed up at the moment. Uh, this is a uh, data shader-based bokeh. It uses all the Holobus tools, um, which we gave a tutorial about on Monday that's now on uh, YouTube. Uh, this particular example is showing you, um, this is running on my laptop here. The rest are all running in the cloud somewhere. Uh, this particular one is uh, looking at uh, a billion points of GPS coordinates so that if I select the right tool and then zoom in, you can watch it uh, systematically refined, refine as I zoom in on something. I don't know, Paris maybe. And the cool thing about this one is that A, it's 50 lines of code, and B, each one of these um, uh, widgets is tied directly to something in that plot using only the computation that's needed. So in this case, if I drag this along, it actually doesn't need, it's all done at, um, locally in the browser. It's not recomputing anything in Python. The same for this one. If I change the map behind it, uh, same thing there. But then other ones, if I change what I'm actually plotting, or uh, how I'm aggregating it, uh, then it has to do a computation and then I'll take a little time. And so systematically saying which bits are tied to which thing, normally would be a massive, nasty nest of callbacks. In this case, it's actually quite straightforward. Like I said, 50, 50 lines of code, you can look at it online. I won't go through them here, because I want to move on. Uh, 
also um, in scope is this is a fairly simplistic example, but this is a multi-page dashboard. This is meant to capture um, uh, some of the Erdic folks uh, showed at a lightning talk, a very complicated uh, multi-step workflow. This is meant to be something like that. Uh, in this case, it uh, starts by taking a snapshot of <laughs> not, not my best. Oh, that's better. All right. Ah! Well, it's probably going to do a bad job on that one because that's not a very good picture. But uh, then you move to the next stage. So the first one was detecting me. It's using some OpenCV um, uh, tools to detect something potentially interesting. I don't think it was successful in this case. But and then it's going to classify it as forehead, chin, and jaw. Okay, that that's me. <laughs> All right. So back to the talk. Um, Th those, were, uh, those were examples, and I'll take you more tutorial style, step by step, until you stop me. So, I guess we'll go back to the full view. All right, so everybody said they had some Jupyter notebook somewhere with some plot in it. And in this case, I'm just going to model all of you. Assume you've got some sort of data set. We'll use uh, one example uh, as an exemplar of, of all of your examples. This particular one is uh, just measuring the environment in a meeting room, like this one, although the occupancy is very low compared to this one. It shows uh, temperature, humidity, uh, light levels, carbon dioxide. Presumably these are related to the occupancy. Um, some interesting relationships you could find there. So let's say we have that. And then let's say you've got some Jupyter notebook and you've Got a plot, right? So here's some plotting code it's based on matplotlib. Basically, it'll take the time series and it'll smooth it and plot it um, with matplotlib while highlighting outliers according to some definition. In this case, it takes a rolling mean and then everything that's a certain number of uh, standard deviations away from the residual between the signal and the rolling mean is considered an outlier. It doesn't matter. So what matters is you can call it and you get a plot. Yay, we're done, we're done, right? No, I, I called it with one particular variable and a couple of different uh, parameters. That's gonna, that is something that could be done, but probably you actually care about these parameters. If you are at all interested in science, you wanna see how, the, how it affects with these, uh, varying these parameters, uh, what are the different variables available. And you can do that in Jupyter Notebook, it's great. But it's slow, it's tedious, plus it's just you and it's Python right in front of you and maybe you want to share it with people who are scared by Python, or that want to be able to have a little easier experience than you do in your life. So uh, let's make a panel. So you import panel. Uh, this installs some JavaScript. And you call this interact function. It's very similar. It's based stolen directly from IPy widgets interact. So it's highly compatible with the, uh, what that supports. And if you pass it some function, it will inspect the uh, arguments of that function figure out what it can find for uh, putting up widgets and give you an immediate interactive function. So if I, if I do that, I can see, oh, this is the smoothing window. You can watch the time series get smoother as I drag it to the right. And this is the how far away from the, um, the, the how, how large a residual must be um, in order to consider an outlier. So if you make it very high, there are a few outliers, eventually a lot. So far, so good, right? Uh, there's one problem, is that this window uh, range was uh, auto-detected and just a guess was used. The top bound is 90, the bottom bound is negative 30. A negative 30 window size doesn't have any meaning. Luckily, it doesn't crash. A zero doesn't have any meaning, um, and so on. So it's, not a, it's, it's useful immediately, but it's maybe not what you want. So. Let's do a little bit more work. That was the zero work case. Oh, and uh, just to make it clear, why did that work with zero work? If you go back to how it was defined, it was able to read this information to put up those widgets. It can tell that uh, this one needs to be an integer, this one will be an integer. Uh, it ignores things that it doesn't understand, like functions, and it ignores things where it's a string. It's not gonna have a widget with all possible strings. Um, so basically, it tries to do a good job with whatever it can figure out. So let's uh, do a little bit more work. Let's say that the window should be a positive number, one or greater, 
the variable should be any of the columns in my data frame. The sigma should have some reasonable value. And now if you do that, you can choose any of the different variables around. And uh, you can, you can uh, drag some of these and there's no inappropriate value anymore. Okay. So let's share it with the boss. And okay, I hit dot show. What that does is launch a server. You probably can't see that unless I exit full screen. Uh, it's visit, it basically spawned a browser tab visiting a local um, uh, URL at this port. So if, I, if my machine happens to be on a network and be fully exposed and have no firewalls and I told my boss to visit it, they'd be able to see this. Hopefully nobody's doing that, but, uh, <laughs> but it would happen. It used to happen in the old days. Uh, nowadays you have some cloud provider and you have some authentication mechanism and I'm not gonna talk about any of that. But anyway, let's say your boss is seeing this and they see this and they come back to you and say, I don't know what this is. Okay, so you need to work a little bit more. Um, so let's look at what we made here. What is this thing? How can we fiddle with it? How can we make it be, how can we have, make it have instructions for the boss, for instance? So let's get a handle on it. Here we're just saving it to a variable and printing it. Ah, okay, what this is, the representation shows that this is a column and the column contains two items. One of them is a column of widgets one of them is a row that happens to have one thing in it, which is a plot. Okay, now I can maybe guess what I can do. So let's unpack it, index it using these uh, coordinates that you saw there, the first thing, the, first, the third item in the first row and so on. And let's add some text and uh, a title and uh, let's hide one of the widgets that I don't want to try to explain to the boss. And now, um, now it says room occupancy, select the variable in the time window for smoothing. And I can put as much detail as I want to there, and it still, um, still works. Okay, we, we uh, did that in the notebook. Can you show the wrapper for the new thing? The wrapper for the new thing, I certainly can. Now it's a road. Uh, it's lost a uh, level of nesting. Those were just automatically created by Interact because it makes it easier to organize things. There's no reason to have it nested that way um, if that's all it is. So it's a row with one thing in the uh, first item and the next has a column with a markdown and a selector and a slider. Okay, so we're happy and we think our boss is gonna be happy. So we'll share it again. And now we have something, maybe not the most beautiful one in the world, but um, dumbed down enough for our boss. And, okay, great. Now, ah, uh, we got too big. Uh, we can still do it back in the notebook. Uh, and one thing to note is that uh, the widgets that we failed to show there, we can still, if we want to have special power that our boss doesn't have, <laughs> we can still mess with them. The boss doesn't need to know that. So uh, basically, the, the reason that works is that the interact command connected, uh, cl created something with a bunch of widgets, some other stuff, and having everything watch everything else. And if you display it and mess with it, that works. But if you display it separately, it also works. It's all reactive, it's all tied together. This is a coherent object that you've pulled a couple of things out, but it's still embedded in, a, in an, uh, the interact object, which is where all these uh, things were defined. Of course, you can also do things by hand. Um, if you, uh, you, all you have to do is, um, each of the widgets here has an associated, what's called a parameter. A parameter, uh, in this case, is named value. You can set the value to whatever you like, um, and it'll update the display, because everything's still linked. And this is the sort of thing you'll do in a callback sometimes, to have everything modify everything else uh, to achieve some complex goal. Or if you're just fiddling with it on the command line, it's also useful. 
Now, we used interact. Interact is a magic thing that often lets you immediately play around and then walk away and delete the cell and never have to worry about it again. There's no software development or anything like that. But if you want to think of yourself more as a software developer, uh, you can instantiate specific uh, explicit widgets. You can uh, wrap the, um, you can de declare um, a dependency between the um, parameter value of this variable then the parameter value of the window. And th those will be passed. Uh, so basically, it's saying that these arguments of the function uh, should be watching the values of these um, widgets. And then again, you put it in a column in a row. And now uh, I happen to use different, well, Philip happened to use different uh, widgets here, uh, but it could have been a drop down and be the same. So this, this approach is what you will use when you put on your software developer hat and you're trying to think, how can I make the great, the great app, the great um, set of widgets that'll solve everything? It um, takes a little bit more thought, but allows you to control everything you want. And it's still a lot easier than a lot of other frameworks that are set up in terms of callbacks. Here it's just saying, when this changes, this will automatically happen rather than, um, well, compare that to other approaches. And uh, one thing that this, this setup will do is allow you to actually completely separate your domain model from your interactive code. In this case, we can define all of the things that we were talking about before without ever importing panel. Uh, we, just because panel is built in an underlying library called Param. Param has no dependencies. Maybe it's NumPy. Anyway, some, a very small amount, a number of dependencies and can be included in any code anywhere. There's no problem uh, with that. And it allows you to capture things like what the variables are and how you vary them and um, some function that can return something. And you can create all of this without ever importing panel. And then separately, if you need an app or an uh, interactive view, you can do so without knowing what on earth obj is. Whatever obj is, the parameters of obj will be displayed here and so on. So it allows you to have the same code that's usable in a batch mode, a supercomputing run, and a server, an interactive session, whatever. There's no, there's no need to tie everything up uh, so that it only can appear in Jupyter, which is what a standard approach is. And that's very important if you have a large code base, can do lots of people with lots of places that shows up. OK, so far we've used Matplotlib. What about other libraries? Um, it doesn't care. Um, use another library, sure. Uh, if you use, uh, in this case, if you use HVplot, it works nicely, gives you hover and so on. And uh, it also, if you use something like HVplot or Plotly or other things that uh, that'll give you access to the individual glyphs and, and uh, other little markers and such, you can set up complicated interactions that we saw in the demos. Uh, I won't go into that now. Uh, some of them are quite simple. You can very easily get a selection and then act on that. Um, others, you can get as complicated as you want. So let's say it's done. Uh, we're, we're done with this for now. Can we keep running as a server? Well, at the moment, what we've done is .show, and we're launching it from a um, Jupyter notebook. But if we have anything in the notebook that happens to have this in it, .servable is just a declaration that if you, were, if you ever are to run it with a bokeh serve or panel serve later, this is something you would want to serve, this particular object. As you notice, we've, seen, we've shown lots of things all along the way. Most of them uh, were just for me to, uh, were not the final product. And some of them are important for telling a story. And so this approach lets you have a notebook that looks through every little part, puts it together, and eventually builds it up into the big thing, the big deployable thing, while fully documenting every step, fully testing every step, showing how to use every little component. This is the thing that you use as an analyst Someday you might want to use this, someday this. The thing you show your boss is at the end, and it's just everything put together. But that's not the view you see. You see the, everything broken up. Hopefully that makes sense. It's super important for a workflow where you're a researcher, iterating over time, deploying <laughs> away from you, and then going back to your work, and then getting a phone call, complaining about the thing you deployed, and you go back to mess, to mess with it. Uh, alternatively, if you were to have your notebook and build a great JavaScript app, you get that phone call about that, you can't go back to your notebook anymore. So it's really designed to, to have it be super easy to flow from every stage. Got something working, 
got a little widget on it, we're able to share it, we're able to deploy it, and then go back as many times as necessary. As soon as your requirements change, easy to, to mess with it, easy to adapt it over time. As soon as your notebook gets too big, you can pull it out and put it in a module, because in no way is it tied to the notebook. So you can have very large code bases eventually, a whole domain model for your whole research area, stored in a proper Python module, and it still all works. So, probably people have heard of other approaches. Uh, Dash has uh, been around for a couple of years. Compared to Dash, Panel is typically much more concise. Obviously, Dash can add more Pythonic things to it, but just given how it's currently uh, implemented, typically panel code will be vastly, vastly shorter and kind of more straightforward. Uh, it's also more Pythonic because its design, panel is designed completely to have you stay in Python and to take care of the things that are necessary to actually have a display in a browser, whereas um, Dash is coming from a company that's supporting a lot of different uh, programming languages, a lot of different approaches. It's not just only for Python. And so it's gonna allow you to give you um, advice to use HTML here, use CSS here, and so on. You can do that with Dash, with a panel, but it's a last resort. It's not normal or typical or expected. It's a, okay, you're having weird requirements, or you need to put uh, your institution's look and feel, which you should probably should do by a theme anyway, but. Um, also, panels designed for most polling libraries rather than specifically Plotly. And also, it's really designed to be fully, completely usable as a notebook in every little part, whereas uh, Dash is typically only about the, the full dashboard. Compared to Voila, it's not really comparable to Voila. It's comparable to Voila plus IPy widgets. Together, that's, that's what um, panel is which is the widget library and the server infrastructure and the ability to, to share and deploy it. So compared to that approach, which has pretty much been developed at the same time, uh, Panel is not tied to Jupyter, which means you can have a .python file, you can have very large things that are really unwieldy in a notebook, uh, large in terms of complexity. Um, you, can be, you can deploy without Jupyter installed at all, it's more scalable in the sense that when you visit a Voila dashboard, it starts up a Jupyter kernel and goes through the entire process from start to finish and then displays the results. Uh, Bokeh server doesn't work that way, but a lot of the computation can happen before a visitor arrives. Um, Dash is at the other end. All this stuff is at uh, in the client in Dash, so it's kind of in between Dash and um, uh, Voila in, in terms of scalability. And this last point is, I've tried to convey that, but the idea is just that um, in Voila, what you deploy is a view of your notebook, and so it, it steers you towards having a notebook that has only the stuff in it that's gonna be in your dashboard, which is one use of it, but Panel is also designed to separate those so you have your development and your things that you care about, and the, the things with 100 knobs, not two knobs, and the thing you share with as a dashboard is separate, or can be separate. To sum up, um, Panel is a Holovitz project. Uh, that's the group formerly known as PyViz, um, it's, which also includes HVPlot, DataShader, Holoviz, GViz, Param, and ColorSet. All of these things work really well with it. So do lots of other things. So these are our go-to tools that we'll pick, but there are lots of other tools uh, that will work just fine with Panel. And that's it. Thank you. We have about five minutes for questions. All right, sounds good. Uh, great talk, thanks, Jim. Uh, my question is, does the serving capability work with async at all? Async IO? Async IO or Trio or Curio, any of them? Not at the moment, but uh, if those things are done at the bokeh level, they, we should be able to inherit that. Yeah. So, and the, the, that's being talked about, discussed actively. I don't know what the plans are. Uh, I don't run Bokeh, um, but I'm friendly with everyone there. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, let's say I have a SQL table that I need to pull data from, say, on a daily basis. Is there a way to get it so 
it pulls up data as it becomes available, or I can schedule some job to, to pull the latest data to put into this? Um, not at the panel level per se, but uh, we certainly have uh, support for uh, streaming plots that you would put in there, and they're just going to wait, and as soon as something arrives, they will update the plot. So there are, uh, that's done at the uh, HV plot. Uh, if you go to hvplot.pybiz.org, there's support. Uh, there's a, a streams with a Z uh, backend. Uh, there'll be examples there on how to do that. So uh, the, a lot of that is really useful, really interesting. In particular, I like those last two slides you gave about comparing and contrasting to other similar libraries. But uh, that actually connects back to your story about presenting to your boss. Because I have a boss who, when I go and show, were to sh if I were to show them that panel, they'd say, oh, wait, but what about IPy widgets? What about all of these other frameworks? And then if I told them all of your slides, they would say, oh, Clearly, this ecosystem has not yet d decided what they want to do, so let's go back to that Fortran plotting library that I wrote 40 years ago. <laughs> so how would you respond to that? How do we as a community you know, respond to that situation? I think I lost the point somewhere along the way, but I'll address the first point, which is IPy widgets. Um, recently, the uh, Voila authors and uh, Philip, the, the main panel author, uh, met and brainstormed about ways that uh, IPy widgets uh, panel and uh, voila can work together. And out of that came one thing so far, which is that any bokeh-based thing, which includes any panel-based thing, can now be used as an IPy widgets. There's a project called IPy Bokeh that, that Philip sort of did overnight. And um, we're, going, we're working to more gradually get that integrated into bokeh proper so that anything in bokeh can appear as a IPy widget, can be used in IPy widget, and work together with any other IPy widget. The other direction is much harder, making um, IPy widgets usable from within Bokeh, and the reason that's harder is that you have to be able to do it without uh, Jupyter. Um, but uh, that a, pr a proof of concept exists. It is something we're working on actively. Expect that by the end of the summer. And then it'll be, if you want to combine Voila with panel inside of Voila, inside of panel, you can probably do that. What is hard to do in panel? Things we haven't yet even conceived of. <laughs> um, we are not anywhere, our set of examples are nowhere, they're at the limit of our time rather than our, uh, they're not at the edge of what the software can do. Uh, you saw we, we tried to have a broad range of different topics and types of things, but we have, we have had not had enough, had enough time to reach the edge of what it can do very well. So we have not mapped out that border at all well. Um, I can say that the multi-page ones, we're planning to have much better support for that. It, but now it supports a, um, a pipeline, um, a linear pipeline. There are a lot of other things you might want to support, so we're going to do a lot of work there. But it, that's not hard work, it's just, uh, it's just things that we haven't gotten to. Um, working with IPy widgets is hard work. We, have, we are doing that. Um, heavy duty uh, customization of everything. At some point you can switch, you just give up and you embed it into a uh, JavaScript template and go from there. That, that's also very well supported. So I don't know how much of that work we'll do in, at the panel level. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, we have a project to embed in a Django uh, app, if that's helpful. Um, we'll have, we're working on a deployment guide showing how to deploy it with Flask and Django and, other, uh, and Heroku and other cases. Um, if you want to buy my employer's product, uh, it'll spin up a container, you hit the deploy button, well, you hit the deploy button, it'll spin up a container, launch, set up the environment, launch everything, and then control authentication to it. And so, uh, that's all great if you have that kind of budget. It's meant for big companies. Gotcha. Okay, last one. Um, what about, so one of the big uh, useful things about Bokeh is actually doing static HTML pages. Everybody's mm -hmm. talking about spinning up web servers. Yep. I'm stuck sending static HTML most at best to my uh, 
you know, my bosses? Is there any plans? It's already done. There's, uh, there are, uh, a lot of the things will work fine just when exported. There's, uh, the widgets need to have some way to have an effect. You know, there's a class called JS link that does a, so if you can define a parameter and it maps directly into something that was already available in JavaScript, that's a one-liner, it just will always, it'll work when exported and it'll happen at the client side. If you need some computation to be done in there, you might have to write a few lines of JavaScript to transform something into what it needs to be consumed by. But if your priority is to make it be runnable as JavaScript, you, you can, you'd have the incentive to write that JavaScript. And in other cases, um, well, or, Switch entirely to the JavaScript you prefer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's thank our speaker one more time.